It is a great pleasure to begin our the last uh, section of conference. And um, uh, Anneli is uh, late, so we begin with the uh, paper of uh, Zane, the next, uh, the next uh, Manfred Ashvirkshdas, yes. Manfred Ashvirkshdas, my colleague from Vilnius, uh, from Vilnius uh, Lithuanian Literature and Folklore Institute. He, um, he make research and uh, published monography um, uh, of um, um, sorry, reflections of simulacrum, poetics of visuality in the uh, poems of Alphonsus Nikanilunas. And he also is uh, the editor of collection articles of uh, the book Alphonsus Nilunat's Poet and His World, and the uh, editor and uh, for word uh, author of Myronis Voices of Springs lyrics. So we are invited him for the paper about the Hen Henrika Snagis as the mediator between Lithuanian and Latvian poetry. Please, Manfredas. Lithuanian poet, essayist, and translator uh, Henrika Snegis was born in Majeiki, uh, province of Samogitia of uh, northern Lithuania. Uh, his uh, mother, Antonina Elfrida Grundman, was a daughter of a Latvian blacksmith who worked in Majeiki. Later, Nagis dedicated a poem to her and uh, revealed uh, the secret symbolism uh, of the earth, or jame, or zeme in Latvian. Uh, mother and the earth are represented there as uh, closest sisters. Mother runs around uh, the earth every day and uh, revives uh, the agricultural traditions and rituals from the lake of Liepoje to the fields of Lemont, as he said. Uh, Liepoje is a Latvian city, and Lemont is a, a suburb of uh, Chicago. Uh, mother looks at the earth with creative insight. Uh, he wrote, you want to sow, to caress, and to weed it all. Uh, concern about uh, the ground and the roots, uh, about the earth, can be related to the, to the uh, conservative tradition of agriculture. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, Nagis never experienced uh, the life of traditional sedentary peasant. Uh, his father was a railway worker and uh, the family had to move between various regions of Lithuania during his uh, young years. Uh, a poet's grandmother was proud of her German origins. Uh, he, he was half uh, Latvian, half German. She was half Latvian, half German, and uh, used to quote stanzas of Schiller and Goethe. And, uh, uh, here we see some uh, differentiation, some uh, divide of uh, uh, different periods of Nagis' uh, poetical uh, evolution. Uh, there were some collections, uh, early collections of his poem, uh, which, are, uh, which can be um, uh, called uh, romantic expressionist. Uh, and uh, some later can be uh, can be called uh, modernist, 
and uh, the latest uh, poetry uh, has features of uh, neo-folklorism and pure lyricism. Uh, in uh, 1953, while already living in Canada, and Nagis wrote a concise but concentrated review of uh, Latvian poetic uh, schools and trends uh, for a magazine, Literatura Slankei, which was the most in influential uh, uh, literary uh, magazine of the exile, the Fainan community. Mentioning uh, major names beginning uh, with such Latvian poets like uh, Juris Alunans from the middle of 19th century up to the greatest names of the interwar uh, modern generation, Yanis Medinis, Alexandros Chakos, Chaks, and Eric Adamsons. Uh, the major literary journals were also mentioned uh, in his review, especially those which played a significant role uh, in the dialogue of modernist and conservative trends. Uh, in uh, pre-war Lithuanian northern province of uh, his native land, uh, the works of uh, German culture were ac acquired through uh, Latvia. Uh, 17 years old Nagis uh, uh, re read uh, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke from the two volumes of this Gesammelte Werke, or Selected Works, uh, which were brought by his aunt uh, from Liepaja. Other sources say that from uh, Riga. Uh, poor visual images, some kind of Protestant modesty, and uh, the economy of expression were specific to the uh, author, uh, authors con translated by Nagis to Walter Snicker, to Gunnar uh, Sal Salinsch, Aina Krauyete, Aina Zemdega, and Astrid Ivaska. Uh, Nagy spent the greatest part of, part of his life in exile, in Western exile. Uh, he got educated in the post-war universities uh, of Austria and Germany during the period of 1944-1949. Defended the thesis of a doctoral degree about the expressionist poetry of Georg Trakl in the Innsbruck uh, University, and later moved to Montreal, Canada, uh, where he taught Lithuanian language in the private schools. And uh, he was uh, a member of, uh, of a political group uh, called Jaminike. Uh, this was uh, related to the uh, symbolism of the F, Jame, uh, and tried to revive post romanticist uh, and neo expressionist symbolism. The specific metaphorical landscape of Nagis was often related to the austere topography of the small towns uh, of, and villages of Jamaitia. Uh, also Magishia, and it was also characteristic to Latvia. Uh, there were plains of dreams where the rivers flow, uh, which uh, remind the winds of the earth. And uh, the river that uh, flow through Latvia, uh, such as Musha, Venta, Vaidmenas, or Vaidmana, the tributary of Venta, uh, are being mentioned in the series of uh, visual impressions and the name of Liepoje city is pronounced uh, uh, in the, when the interiors inherited from childhood and long ago forgotten decorative uh, figures are being reminded in the poem uh, Latina Magica. Uh, Expect from fragment from uh, this poem. The uh, uh, cross of the window falls on the wall of an even room. The silhouettes of ships are swinging. Liepoje, a small statue of electric blacksmith, forges and forges a piece of red iron. The sailing boats keep a regular uh, in a battle. A copper made pendulum shimmers evenly, uh, light and shadow. Uh, a father's voice and the roar of great city, night and silence. 
Uh, this complex um, uh, of images uh, alludes to the photograph of the double exposure of uh, sailing vessels seen through the window blend with the toy ships and the battles. The idol of the suspended moment uh, and static objects uh, is opposed to the monotonous rhythm of mechanic pendulum and electric blacksmith. The view of a port, uh, just like the view of a Basel railway station, is common to the poetry of Nagis. Both of them evoke nostalgia of open space and unscheduled journeys, and both of them can be related to the childish impressions of the industrial city of Liepaja. Um, uh, the image of oil stained water means the symbol of urban civilization uh, blurring uh, in the clean and clear uh, surfaces. It also seems to be the sign of technological uh, progress which characterized uh, the uh, interwar Latvian landscape. And, uh, uh, the collection uh, Blue Snow, uh, or Mele na Snega, uh, 1960, uh, differs from the yellow Nagis creative material. Uh, political language uh, here is uh, simplified, the laws of economy uh, are emphasized, and Nagis uh, seems uh, to be related to Latvian uh, poet Gunnar Salinc, uh, and to other members of a New York-based uh, uh, group, Hell's Kitchen, uh, who were highly impressed by American-English imagist uh, poetry, such as poets at Ezra Pound, uh, Thomas Tens Eliot. Uh, the leading uh, figures of Latvian Hell's Kitchen, Hell's Kitchen is uh, the uh, mm, district of Manhattan in New York, uh, in the 1950s, uh, we were the first uh, literary generation of exile, just like the Union group of Jaminiki. Uh, Latvian distinctive uh, exile poets were younger than uh, Lithuanian ones, because the Latvian exile culture didn't experience uh, stylistic revolution in the first post-war years when the collections of uh, Alphonsus Nikonilunas and Genericus Nagis were published in 1946, still in the days of uh, culture in Germany and Austria, uh, in the camps of uh, displaced persons. The beginning of uh, Latvian exile uh, modernism was associated with a uh, collection of verses uh, Niklas Kruaks by Salinch, 1957. Such a long creative pause uh, can be explained by the feelings of defeat and uh, despair that were common to Latvians after the downfall of the Kurzeme stronghold in May of 1945, in the last day of the Second World War. Nagis had always emphasized the intoxicating uh, influence of Rilke's uh, philosophical meditations. And Rilke was translated into Latin by Salinch and into Lithuanian by Nagis, uh, same. And uh, Nagis uh, uh, wanted to blend his strongly emphasized national identity with openness to the world and uh, uh, all its exotic features. He said, give me a chip of glass, let me dug out sway in Granada, Bahia, Shvantoi, and the smoke is in. Bahia is uh, in Brazil, uh, such a place. Uh, the chip of glass was reminded uh, uh, as a metaphor of fragmented existence in a poem without name by Salinch. Uh, it lies on the street of New York, rebinding the piece of a lost sky and reflecting the subject identity. Uh, that bleak uh, identity provokes many doubts because the observer and reflection are not of the same origin. Uh, he said in his poem, uh, and perhaps there was not me. How could I know what would be my appearance in heaven? Uh, the poets of exile meditate on the broken world and on its fragments, and their uh, uh, metaphysical illusions are denounced, and the artists themselves look like the ghosts. 
The exile person feels lonely in the big world. Nevertheless, uh, he can travel where he wants, or he can create fictional uh, words of poetry. Uh, Nagis wrote uh, poetical letters to the imaginary addressees, uh, Martyrs of Budapest, of the so anti-Soviet revolt of 1956, to the colonial African beauties, to the daughters of uh, Hong Kong, uh, fishermen, and so on. He was uh, attentive to uh, Latvian poetess uh, Astrid Ivaska and uh, to uh, her uh, cosmopolitan impressions from the famous European uh, landmarks. Ivaska was constantly uh, uh, looking uh, for places of uh, earthly paradise and uh, she saw an, uh, an idol of the Greek island of Paris where the death tends to the painless uh, sleep. Uh, uh, it is good to live in the island of Paris where the old people die looking at the sea, she, she wrote. And uh, Ivaska and her husband uh, mediator between the different languages and cultures. Estonian researcher and uh, a professor of uh, Oklahoma University, editor of a literary magazine Books Abroad, uh, Ivar Ivask, both were enthusiasts of the unity of uh, Finn Baltic region. However, uh, uh, primarily they identified uh, themselves with uh, European uh, contexts. And uh, uh, Ivaska admitted that four countries, Austria, Spain, Greece, and Finland, and the poets thought he had to realize what was uh, life and death indeed. In uh, Nagis poetry, there are occasional allusions to the European sides, but uh, those visions of foreign lands remain, remain with terrorist snapshots, uh, illustrating uh, 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 the naive myth of uh, the primordial paradise. Uh, he wrote, in the legendary island of Capri, one can find the uh, slim jacks and women in the legendary island of Capri. Children bring the sun in their handfuls, and so on. And uh, uh, Nagis was concerned uh, about his native Lithuania and about its problems. And the other countries didn't evoke nostalgia to him. They were as important as they recalled his native experience. The Latin poets, uh, on the contrary, seems to be seem to be more open to the urgent topics and to be more cosmopolitan. Uh, in the later texts uh, uh, by Nagis, uh, he turned uh, to the folklore interpretations. We can distinguish a mythic uh, Aitvaras, literary kite, a flying god of fortune, or falcon, Nifeinus Sakalos a godlike being with eyes and amber. Uh, Nagis emphasized the semantics of north, uh, with which was related to the Arctic Canadian landscapes and to the topography of Lithuania and Latvia, presuming the prehistoric uh, kinship. And, uh, uh, as critic uh, Schulbeuris, Rimeda Schulbeuris uh, summarized, uh, a final embodiment of this mystic uh, uh, is the northern star around which stands the constellation of Great Bear, uh, always pointing north, that now comes to symbolize the friendship of the free and brave, as well as the longing to be back home under the northern sky. All this may, after all, be a different form of other writers' nostalgia born in this possession. Uh, sometimes Nagis was called Sibelius of Lithuanian poetry, uh, referring to the world famous Finnish composer. And because um, uh, the motives of uh, North were evident in his poems, and the northern landscape was often meditated as a distinctive uh, symbol. But now was contemplated as a metaphysical, uh, eschatological realm, which should be rediscovered by all post-war uh, Baltic emigres in the end of a lifelong journey. And uh, 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 many researchers who review uh, Latvian poetical tradition pay attention to its folklore-based roots. 
Uh, those routes were newly acquired and were exiled during the period of 1952-56. A collection of 12 volumes of Latvian folk songs was published in Copenhagen, and uh, it was topical not only as a monument of, to dying tradition, but also as a direct uh, source of inspiration uh, for modernist literature. Uh, Ivar Ivask uh, has noted that the pagan rituals, rituals of fertility uh, are still alive in Latvian and Lithuanian subconsciousness, and uh, that Catholic belief uh, that the world really materialized itself into body evokes uh, mystical imagination uh, of Lithuanians. Uh, Nagis contemplated the Baltic identity recreating the archaic and idealized epoch of a unified nation when mystical state of the Nava existed and uh, the song was stronger than death in the poem of uh, uh, diary. Uh, ancient uh, dual forms of grammar he used uh, because uh, the subject immortalized himself uh, in the history alongside uh, uh, alongside this, bravo. Uh, uh, and uh, the prehistoric uh, 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 time of the Navo was full of gamma. Uh, metaphors of poetry had been recognized in its pri primitive uh, shapes of nature, and creative words were interpreted as material things. They mean metallity, energy, and the restored pantheistic worldview. And uh, so, uh, as to say, uh, Latvian exile poetry, as it could be seen from the quoted translations of Nagis, or all these poets were translated by Nagis, might be evaluated as very feminine or feminist. It was dominated by sensual and vital elements. It seems to be full of metricentric mythology and subtle perception of beauty. Nagis appreciated such kind uh, of uh, equitable feminine, although uh, at metaphorical field of his own vision was full of masculine symbolism, heroism, military tendencies, and pathos of struggle. Latvian exile poetry and its sudden prosperity in the 1960s for him was an important argument proving that even under agrarian conditions, the literary revival was still possible. It was not to him to conciliate with the inevitable downfall of literature and native language of the diaspora. He was hoping that Lithuanian poetry, just like the language of itself, uh, had reached the high level of perfection and can decline. According to Nagis, Latin language in the beginning of the 20th century was not so uh, resonant and flexible enough, and uh, he, uh, it seemed not to be quite suitable for classical poetical forms. But Latvian poets uh, adequately demonstrated their master skills and their power of imagination to revive their creative traditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manfredas. And now the uh, second speaker, I would like to invite uh, Anneli Mikelev, um, researcher from Tallinn University. She published monograph, um, The Poetics of Illusion, in 2005, and her fields of research include Estonian literature, illusions in literature and culture, and compa comparative literature. So she is a, a co-editor of some books. So her paper will be Modernity, Inter Intertextuality, and Decolonization in Estonian and Latvian Literatures. So please, please Anneli. Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry for, for several confusions. And uh, now I am here. And try to find the presentation also.
now it's PowerPoint. Or anything and no. I don't find it. Okay. Oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> the first time. It's okay, it's too short. Mm -hmm. So, if, but just put it FP, it's okay. If, yeah. My topic is about modernity, intertextuality, and decolonization, Estonian and Latvian literature. And uh, I'd like to speak about uh, uh, not only at the literature from the beginning of the 20th century, but also literature from the 21st century. Estonia and Latvia have been colonized several times in different periods of history. Every colonization influences a colonized country politically, economically, and culturally, and colonial traces persist everywhere in a colonial, colonized society particularly in social manners, behavior, and culture. After a period of colonization, a period of decolonization is needed. According to Walter D. Mignolo and Linda T. Smith, decolonization includes uh, long-term processes involving, the, involving the bureaucratic, cultural, linguistic, and psychological divesting of culture, uh, colonial power in the court. The result of the decolonization is a new people and community. Mignola states uh, that uh, non-enlightenment and third world become almost synonymous terms, and they made visible the hidden face of modernity, that is, coloniality. Therefore, decolonization became a choice by those who needed to delink rather than deciding of those who were in a condition to marginalize. And of course. Although Mignolo focuses uh, mainly on the colonization of Latin America and in the Third World, uh, similar tendencies are also apparent um, in Baltic states. Estonia and Latvia were colonized by Germany, Sweden, and the Russian Empire. The main question is how it's possible to go through a long decolonization process to reach decolonial freedom and independent uh, through. Uh, how to come to believe that 20th century modernity is our modernity, not a copy or imitation of that of the colonizing culture. The processes involved depend on cultural transfer, cultural relations, and modernizations, uh, modernization of smaller and peripheral nation, national cultures. All of these processes make it possible for small and peripheral nations to find their own originality within European culture. Juri Lotman has described these cultural processes as follows. <clears throat> the dynamics of a culture can be represented as neither an isolated immanent process, nor the passive sphere of external influences. Intersection with um, other cultural structures may be achieved um, in a variety of ways. Thus, an external culture in order to enter into our world must cease to be external to it. It must find for itself a name and a place in the language of the culture into which it seeks to insert itself. But in order to change from a lion to own, this external culture must, as we can see, submit to a new name in the language of the internal culture. An external alliance culture may function as a metatext in um, an own culture, and it can describe the own culture itself via autocommunication. The literary works of smaller nations' cultures, uh, such as Estonia and Latvia, represent cultural processes in the process of modernization and the modernist period in literature at the beginning of the 20th century and also in the 21st century. And uh, I have some examples um, from the famous text from 
world literature. And first uh, text, what I, what I want to, what about I want to speak is Hamlet. For example, the Gustav Suits uh, poem series Hamlet the Prologue. Uh, the pro prologue of Hamlet uh, from 1930, which was published in Suits' second collection, Tulema, The Land of Winds, uh, at the same time. Uh, and Hamlet the prologue was written to celebrate a very important event in Estonian culture. On uh, the 24th of August 1913, the Estonia Theatre's new building opened in Tallinn. It was a drama theatre and later became an opera house. Gustav Suits wrote Hamlet the prologue for opening of a new theatre house. It was a very important day for Estonians. Hamlet, the Danish prince, became a historical symbol as a man who fought uh, during a complicated and hostile time. Hamlet the prologue contains seven poems, and each poem has its own unique structure, but all of the strophes contain three lines echoing Dante's Terza Rima from Divina Commedia from 1472. This is an Estonian example. Uh, Suits used uh, two external texts to describe and interpret Estonian culture, but more than the form of Terza Rima connects Suits prologue uh, with Dante's drive-in comedy, the content of the prologue is similar to Dante's work. The poem series is like a journey through Estonian history and landscapes and images of reality, alternate uh, with uh, images of fantasy or dreams, uh, or dreams and motives. So its seven poems form a parallel with uh, purgatory in Dante's work um, or in uh, religious text. In the fifth poem, except from the same poem, Swiss so presents uh, the ghost of the great William Shakespeare, the last uh, verse. Uh, who finally has arrived in Estonian theatre and culture, and the protagonist, Prince Hamlet, is a symbol of that time. So its poem is an Estonian poem about Estonian culture, because it's not translated into English, into German, or other languages. But both Dante and Shakespeare help him to talk about Estonian culture. They literally work, act, uh, act as metatexts. Gustav Suits is not the only poet to use the motive of Hamlet in his work. Paul Erik Rummo uh, was one of the major authors of the Estonian poetry innovation of the 1960s. His poem, Hamlet the Laulud, Hamlet Songs, was published in 1964. In his uh, second collection of poetry, Tula Ikka Mu Rõõmude Juude, <coughs> Always Come to My Joys. Uh, it's obvious that uh, more serious aspects, together with a sense of danger and the realization of life's fragility, are represented in the second collection, especially in the poem Hamlet's Song, according to Estonian researcher Silja Olask. The second part of the song sounds like an answer to Shakespeare's protagonist's uh, famous uh, monologue, To be or not to be. And <clears throat> Rummo's answer is, yes, to be, to be, certainly to be. This is exception was from that poem. <clears throat> this poem was innovative in Estonian literature and was used uh, in choral music at the beginning of the 1960s. It formed a prologue uh, to the innovations in Estonian theatre in the second half of the 1960s. Paul-Erik Rummo's play Cinderella, Cinderella Game uh, from 1969, which alludes to Prince Hamlet, is one of the significant plays in the development of Estonian drama. Consequently, Hamlet as a literary figure has, ve has been very uh, important and influential motive in Estonian literature and culture. And Rumo's text forms the uh, axis around uh, which um, revolve not only written texts, but also such cultural aspects as theatre performances and music. <coughs> The next text, what, uh, what uh, I think is very important uh, metatext is, uh, for Estonian culture, is the Bible. The Bible is a text which has influenced Estonian culture, especially Estonian literary culture, for a long time. There are lots of quotations, allusions, and symbols from the Bible in Estonian literary text. The function of the old biblical muse is to create the eternal musical dimensions in literary work and create contact with old nations. 
Ja see pärast Estonian text in which the destiny of Jews is identified with the destiny of Estonians. For example, Oh, I am the poor town of Tartu by Kasu Hans from 1708 when actually Ra Russians destroyed Tartu. And Johann Lee's poem, Like Ants and Israel, from 1908. The Bible functions uh, as a metatext in Estonian culture which, which describes Estonian culture itself via auto communication. Another function of the Bible is to describe temporally and geographically distant cultures and countries uh, which have influenced the Estonian culture through cultural transformations. Uh, the parents of an Estonian translation of the Bible uh, from uh, 1739 uh, was very significant in, the, in that Estonian culture became more dialogical using both communication and um, auto-communication. And the relationships between the self and the other were taken to a new level. The main themes of the Estonian contemporary writer is Ene Mikkelson, neo-mythological literary works, both poetry and prose, are the severance of the identity of Estonians after the war and attempts to rediscover the deeper continuity of identity which are often partly condemned uh, to fail. The intervention of social and political rules into personal self-knowledge and the forced and unconsciously accepted forgetfulness of past relationships and of national sources of self-creation. Mikkelson refers to several biblical legends in her poetry and novels, for example, the legend of John the Baptist and Cain and Abel, she interweighs the different legends to describe national Estonian history and culture. Mikkelson used the motive of Avasverus was, um, for the first time as a poetic subject in the collection A Calling Voice, which allude to uh, uh, John the Baptist from 1993. The legend, legend of the Wandering Jew is connected with the biblical legend of the brothers Cain and Abel, Cain killed his brother, Abel, and his punishment was similar to the wandering Jews, punishment to travel as a refugee in the world, although Cain didn't under the protection of God. The legend of Cain and Abel is uh, reflected in civil wars in contemporary times, but Mikkelson presents the legend of the wandering Jew and Cain and Abel in the context of Estonian history. The legend of the wandering Jew is mean to connect the dead and living as well as the real world and the world of the hereafter in Mikkelson's uh, novel. But this doesn't work out because the uh, dead ancestors doesn't hear the voices, the voices of living people. The meeting with ancestors is just a dream. And finally, I'd like to speak uh, again uh, our uh, Latvian and uh, Lithuania and uh, Estonian authors from, from the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, a Latvian writer, Rudolf Laumann, is a lyrical, lyrical presentation of nature in his source, short stories, um, is connected with national culture, which is similar in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. It's mainly a present culture where nature plays a major rule in everyday life. The lyrical description of nature in Plaumannis works also reflect uh, Latvian folklore, the Dainas. At the same time, these lyrical motifs make Plaumannis style softer and emphasize romantic episodes that stand in contrast to rational reality. The psychological is a strong element in Plaumannis stories. It develops uh, characters and dramatic actions carefully and he was a master of psychology, according to Ingono Tauks, the Silas, Silas program, Latvian researcher. Plaumannis wrote several short stories which have very exciting psychological plots, for example, Raudup's video, In the Shadow of Death, and one of the most significant short stories in the context of critical realism, Andriksson from 1898. Uh, this uh, conflict between a landlord and the peasant Andriksson who rents his family from the landlord. It's a very complicated 19th century situation reflecting both the historical and the colonial background. 
Andriksson comes to the manor to explain why he has cut down the oaks on his farm without asking the landlord's permission. The two men quarrel because uh, neither of them understands the sense of justice of the other. The problem is that the landlord has his own rules, colonial rules, and the peasant has a different understanding of justice. Peasants also want to pass the property from father to son and landlords too. Andriksson leaves the manor and enact as a revengeance. He sets fire to the forest. Then he realizes that his children may be in the forest and people tell him that his boys have not returned home. The fire is soon contained and the landlord finds Andriksson's children and gives them to their father. He doesn't punish Andriksson, and Andriksson feels great remorse because which is a punishment. This story is an exception in the context of a critical realism at the end of the 19th century. There is no noble heroes or noble peasants similar to aristocrats in, uh, as in Wilder's short stories and novels. In his uh, first period, for example, Man in the Black Cloak. Uh, from 1886, there is no ideological opposition, for example, bad landlords versus a noble peasant, which was a typical element, element of fiction of the end of the 19th century and rep represented colonial or post-colonial relations. This, this plowman is short story shows national and class oppositions be being overcome and merely presents uh, human nature, both its bad and good sides. It seems Plaumannis was really an innovator in this way and a decolonial author. Plaumannis showed his interest in human nature in other short stories, Raudup's videos, video in the lap of happiness, etc. The roots of their stories lie in romantic tales uh, with the exciting adventures and passionate love stories. Although Palomani's stories were often set in manners, they were targeted at, at more than the middle class, as pointed out by Richard Lehan in his remarks uh, about the middle class realist novel. Nature expressed the feeling of human beings in Blaumannis and Wilder's short stories. Peasant live with, uh, with uh, nature, sometimes struggle against it, and sometimes lose the struggle. For example, in Blaumannis, in the shadow of death. It seems the rule of nature in Blaumannis and Wilder's works represents uh, the Baltic lifestyle, which uh, affected peasants and aristocrats in different ways. Both writers used more of the uh, more of their own cultural system and language as metatext to describe the cultural system, rather than using external cultural systems and languages. The transformed realist uh, romanticism and uh, psychological realist styles and language into internal or own cultural system. And for conclusion, all of the stories and poems demonstrate how small and peripheral cultures find their own original natural cultures and how cultural influences and transformations work um, through cultural dynamic processes. If we have our own, our own Hamlet, Shakespeare, Dante and other cultural legends, we can communicate with other cultures and they can communi communicate with us. And finally, we can describe our own culture via autocommunication. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Aned, for the interesting uh, interpretation of modernism and in intertextuality. And now, I would like to invite the second speaker she is um, uh, from Latvian Academy of Latvian Academy, Zania Schillina from Riga. Um, her dissertation was the idea of the new world in Rainer's place in 2007, and this, is, uh, this research and our um, and paper will be about Rainer's.
Tendencies of expressionism in Rhine's literary works. I played, I danced. Please, Zane. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to focus on the play written almost a century ago. And uh, as you can imagine, I can sp uh, speak about this topic uh, for days, but I, uh, I will try to um, include my, 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 my thesis in, in the limited time. So, uh, during the years of World War I, essential changes can be identified in the creative works by Rainis. The poet uh, does not only emphasize responsibility of art towards its epoch, foregrounds the need of expressing topical feelings and solving the most significant issues posed by the era, but turns also to the search for new stylistic means of expression. Essentially, it means a move uh, towards expressionism. Although Ryan's attitude of expression to expressionist art was ambiguous even more so, the poet mostly addressed harsh criticism to expressionism. He knew its basic uh, postulates well enough. Um, uh, due to uh, his fairly active interest in German contemporary literature, and in literary works by Leonid Andreev, the Russian playwright and prose writer whose oeuvre is marked by very obvi obvious expressionist features, both in the choice of themes and also in the specific characteristics of uh, his poetics, especially the use of uh, hyperbolization and grotesque. Andreev's name has been mentioned in Ryan's letters, diaries, notes, and drafts of his new works from uh, 1903 till 1913. And these documents give evidence that Ryan's knew Andreo's writings well, and also his views on issues of art aesthetics. Besides, cre creative activity of the Russian author has quite frequent, frequent, frequently been an object of direct reflection, as well as one of the most favored examples when commenting on different strengths of, in society and art. It is possible that in Andreo's works, Ryan's found the source of direct and implicit impulses also for his own creativity. In his writing, Ryan's always tried to follow the current trends in art, at the same time elaborating his own specific style of expression. Therefore, his art is characterized by a peculiar combination of the traditional and modern, or, in other words, specifically Latvian elements combined with European modernist features. One of the brightest examples is the play I played, and, I played and Danced, which is marked by trends akin to German and Russian expressionist art, as well as their very specific tra translation into Latvian tradition. Examining Rhine's link with express expressionism, one has to mention another, another significant aspect. More than any other trend in art, Expressionism is associated not only with a search for a new ways and approaches in art, but also with a specific political and social background. One can even talk about the special spirit of the epoch characterized uh, by a poignant sense of disharmony of the world. Horrors of World War I, sense of cold hopelessness in the crumbling world, experience of the tragic events of uh, 19, 1905, the life full of uncertainty during emigration in Switzerland, and the sense of guilt to the homeland devastated by war uh, could not but influence also Rhine's already acute and exalted world perception. Although the idea of the I played, I danced has been uh, convinced and brewing in the poet's mind for more than 10 years. Uh, the text of the play was written in an extremely short period of time, approximately from January 4, uh, 1915 till February 27, the same year, while Reins was in emigration. The poet has repeatedly emphasized that a strong, even decisive uh, impulse for the bulk of the text of I Played, I Danced was the specific political situation, World War I and the shock caused by it. Therefore, 
it is quite logical that much of the play deals with representation of relationship between life and death, the living and the dead. It does not merely in a peculiar way characterize the nation's historical experience and Rhine's social and political position, but reflects the poet's ethical ideals, outlines the collapse of his dream of future vision, and explicitly uh, conveys the poet's emotional state during writing the text. Significantly, the relationship between life and death, the living and the dead, is also one of the central themes in expressionist art, and its popularity is determined by the topical political and social events at uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, uh, as well as by development of the industrialized society and loss of spirituality in man caused by that. Triumph of uh, devastation and death in the 20th century has apparently been most harshly manifested and experienced in expressionist art. Years of the revolutions and World War I uh, meant a victorious march of death, the horror of physical, uh, physiological disintegration and bodily decay at the beginning <clears throat> of the 20th century was coupled uh, with horrors brought along by the world's technological development, namely uh, spiritual death when a human being turned into one out thing in mundane life or a mechanism subjected to the rules of society. Thus, uh, one of the most significant expressionist themes is transformation of a human being into a thing, turning of individual into ex an extension of the machine and succumbing to its luring uh, grandeur. Explicit manifestation of the theme can be identified in uh, jo uh, Georg Kaiser's dramatic uh, trilogy, uh, The Gas. Um, as well as in the play by Leonid Andreo, King Hunger, in which a human being and machine merge into a monstrous hybrid. The factory image characteristic of expressionist aesthetics can be also seen in Fritz Lang's film Metropolis. You can see those examples in the slide. It is essential that the grotesque portrayal of human body in expressionist art does not merely, merely represent physical death, but also the internal state of individual. The spiritual state, the uh, deformity of spirit, emptiness, and peculiar aspiration of to death, sometimes decay and degeneration. Kindred ideas are linked also with grotesque representations of the union between the living and the dead in Rhine's writing. In uh, 1925, uh, forward to the play I played and danced, uh, it means more than, yeah, it means 10 years after the complete uh, finishing the play. Reins emphasizes two aspects significant in the context of the present study. Firstly, I play I danced is a play written with this concrete socially political aim. Secondly, I play I danced presents a synthesis of the tragic and the comic. And this is one of the preconditions of the grotesque. Um, uh, the above, uh, the above uh, mentioned aspects can be clearly identified in the master's image. The master, according to Ryan's interpretation, is a German baron, vamp vampire. Uh, this image uh, combines the living and the dead because the master lies in the coffin without, without decay. He is still capable of rising from the dead uh, to inflict harm to cattle and people. It is significant uh, that uh, similar, similar uh, images representing death are characteristic for expressionist art. You can see some examples, well-known examples, I suppose. Returning to Rhine's I played, I danced, it must be noted that the outer appearance of the master foregrounds such attributes that are clearly asso associated with death and decay. Thus, for exam example, before uh, going to the devil's barn, uh, the master orders the devil's boy uh, to spruce him up in a peculiar way, uh, to sprinkle him with dust, to decorate his brows with leeches instead of necktie, to put round his neck a snake, a snake and so on. These uh, appalling um, accessories are in dissonance with the comic uh, 
uh, effect created by the master's behavior. He's boasting with his uh, class superiority. Uh, the master's dust is, mo this is the quote, uh, dust is more lavishly dusty, the bones are rattling more drilly, and his uh, strength stinks more uh, fiercely than of the dead of a lower social status. He guards from a potential chiefs uh, the splendid decoration of burial. He boasts arrogantly of his special skills to inflict harm to people, uh, yet being uh, German, he is afraid of the pagan spirits and deities. I, can, I didn't show the quotation because it is a uh, little bit specific. The dead master's movements uh, have also been dully described. Uh, they are stiff, sharp, and lifeless. When the master claps his hands, they sound like wood, thus creating a frightening uh, mood. Yet at the same time, he is granted also the functions of an alive body and the biological features linked with them, uh, which sometimes provide a comic uh, tonality. For example, when sucking blood, the master uh, has to observe moderation because of his weak stomach and quick spells of uh, dizziness. The master's image is connected with some more particularly characteristic episodes. While um, lying in the coffin, his leg vertebra drops off, but uh, the devil's boy later puts it back towards the uh, main character of the play, uh, with a crowbar smashes the master's hand in splinters, but ordered by the master, the devil's boy pours them into his uh, shirt sleeve, thus rearranging the messed up bones. Uh, devils pull out a vein from the master for towards to have to the necessary string, but later, later on uh, the vein is re replaced by the coffin rim and so on. Thus, the master in I Played and Danced is uh, a grotesque image. It combines in itself both the eerie and the funny, and resembles a deformed do doll that can either fall into bits and pieces, and then uh, can be mechanically re reassembled again. Besides, it is important that in the image of the master, Ryan's emphasizes not only the vampire's high uh, social status and macabre functions, but also his affiliation uh, to past. The master is tall and fat, this is quotation again, in long and lavish coat made of black velvet with, with white socks, reaching his knees, a white wig like in the 18th century, a bone who proned his head with 12 teeth resembling a crown, the end of the quote. The grotesque um, rejuvenation procedures of the master and the house of bones and the devil's barn is a peculiar way represented the harsh re reality. Uh, succumbing of the people to the hypnotic powers of the past this, uh, that uh, facilitates periodic rebirth of these shadows in the world of the living. Uh, with the help of the master's image and the play at the hall, on the hall, Ryan to, tries to liberate the nation from this dangerous appeal. It must be noted uh, here once more that unlike expressionists, uh, Kaiser, Toller, Andreev, whose plays are clearly dominated by the tragic, uh, tragic pathos and terrify, uh, terrifying grotesque, namely death gains uh, upper hand over life, Ryan say play they dance quite ex uh, extensively uses also the possibilities offered by the comic, and it develops the idea about the liberating and creative powers of the comic. You can see what, oh, quotation from the, of the uh, Ryan's diary. Thus, um, it has been extremely important for the poet not only to write about the calamities ex experienced in the past, but also to po point out the necess necessity to overcome the shadows of the past, and more so, not by giving them to oblivion or light-mindedly ignoring uh, their impact, but by spiritually embracing them and clas clasping them is in, in one's hand. At the end of the act two of the play, the superiority of the master is degraded because um, in order to get sooner to the expected ent entertainment, music and dancing at the devil's party, he lifts towards together with the devil's boy on his shoulders and with sweet on his forehead uh, carries him to the devil's barn. 
It is interesting that initial, initially Rhines had intended to emphasize in this episode another sarcastic detail, and this is proved also by his except, uh, excerpt of the text of the would-be play uh, dating back to January 29, um, 1915. Quote, Master, I will carry you to the coffin. You are newly dead clumsy. I brought benefits. And then in uh, brackets, German culture and capitalism have also given benefits. The end of quote. Writing this note, Rhinus did not associate the master only with feudalism, uh, but also capitalism, which means suppression of, uh, suppression of people and exploitation in much wider sense of the world. Um, I'm afraid I will uh, put aside one of uh, the thoughts because I see in my clock that time is running out. Um, another significant feature uh, distinguishes the way uh, the grotesque combination of the living and the dead is presented in expressionist art and in the play by Ryan's I played I danced. Uh, one of the main subjects of uh, one of uh, the main objects of interest of expressionists, despite the generally human ideas manifested in their work, is the urbanized environment and the factory as one of its most specific attributes. Therefore, it is only um, to be expected that expressionist art pays attention also to the peculiar industrial realization of people. Parts of human body, when individual dies spiritually, are transformed into parts of machinery governing the relationships in the world. While Ryan's grants importance to the peasant's sense of light, life accumulated over centuries as well as the heavy burden of uh, historical heritage, to be more precise, the specific experience of the feudal epoch. Boy. Uh, thus, if expressionist drama combines into, into one eerie image, a human being and a machine, human being and factory, Rhines, in act three of the play I Planned and Danced, in the Devil's Threshing Barn scene, introduces terrifying grotesque images, combining human skeleton and flail, which in this, in this case, not so much significant peasant's tool of work, but rather functions as an attribute of the hard feudal to toil. The scene of threshing in the barn is made particularly macabre, uh, macabre and uh, emotionally harsh by the fact that the remains um, of the dead are not only the material of his, uh, this torment, but also its instrument. Devils not only merely thresh their bodies and bones of the dead, but thresh them with these bones. Besides, the visual effect is supplemented by the sound pattern of the text adapted to the threshing rhythm. You can see oh, this example. Uh, I, I, I didn't dare to try to translate it. <laughs> Uh, analyzing the relationship between life and death, the living and the dead in Ryan's play, I played and danced, one must also mention the mot motif of the dance, uh, which is one of the most important light motifs of the play, I played and danced. Ryan's has used it in a variety of ways, but for the context of the given paper, the dance of the climax of the act one uh, is particularly significant when the dead master dances with Lelde, and during the dance sucks the three, three fateful drops of blood. Although the variation of dancing in the play are possibly connected with impulses rooted in folk tradition, the masters and Lelde's dance uh, can also be interpreted as a peculiar modification of the dance of death. Besides, it is to be um, Noted that the motif of the dance of death in the 20th century art is reintroduced by the expressionism. Some uh, examples are mentioned here. Unfortunately, it uh, would took too a lot of time to uh, uh, to to read them. Um, it is essential. Essential, uh, essential that expressionism does not interpret dancing death as fatal and invincible force, but as uh, exceptions brought 
about by specific political and social causes, for example, war, industrialized, industrialized society, and for which, uh, consequently, man is responsible. Such a trend can be also observed in Ryan's play, A Play Day Danced, in which the masters and Lelda's dance introduces the theme of the uh, devastating and destructive past expanded later in the play. Uh, yet Ryanis, as well as the expressionists, do not only interpret the construction of man in a peculiar way, but also show resurrection of the dead. For example, um, Leonid Andreyo, in the final scene of the play, King, King Hunger, shows the desolate open space lit by blood red light of the sunset in which an old cannon is raised on large wheels while corpses of the re rebellions um, are lying in front of it. And uh, then you uh, can read the translation of this scene. So the dead are rising for uh, their thumbs. And uh, the play ends with uh, King Hunger's uh, text, faster, faster, the dead are rising. Um, one of the most expressive scenes of Rising of the Dead in the play I played, I danced, is the cemetery scene in Act Two. Its setting was described by Ryan's as follows. Um, an ancient cemetery, old graves and crosses, tall trees, everything is overgrown by bushes and uh, creepers. There are some graves in the foreground like knolls. It is quite dark. Later the moon comes out dark red. There are some uh, more details uh, chosen by Ryan. It's in a very typical uh, expressionist manner, very emotional, very uh, visional, and in any case, uh, it ends with this uh, rising of the dead. And now I uh, sum up, although it is not so easy to do, as you see, because the end of uh, my presentation uh, is uh, like uh, naming the themes I could speak about. Uh, but in the very conclusion, I can say that uh, one more very uh, specific and very important thing, very uh, important theme that uh, unites the Rhine's artistic uh, quest and expressionist art is uh, uh, the looking for the future man, uh, which uh, is the uh, uh, main character of the play, towards uh, which and in this uh, character, in, uh, in this character, in very specific uh, way, is combined this rebellious and creative principle and those uh, very high ethical values, very characteristic not only to a uh, lot of expressionists, but to Ryan's as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zane. And now we have the the next and the last our speaker, John Cook from United States of America, and his very intrigued title of paper, The Adriatic Baltic tra transver Transversal. Uh, Daniel Kirsch through the prism of a Baltic writing on essentialism and diversity. So as the hymenotic cycle, we return to the, to the start of our conference, perhaps. This diversions and essentialism is in our mind again. Please. Thank you, Ashura. <clears throat> uh, I hope you can hear me OK. The, uh, the, the cold has gotten very bad. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I picked this up in Warsaw, not in Riga. OK. Um, first of all, my thanks to the committee for uh, um, selecting my paper uh, proposal, which gives me a chance to come here and learn from you all and uh, explore Baltic culture a bit. Um, and just a quick side note, I'm currently a, a Fulbright professor at the University of Szeged in Hungary, uh, and I'll be there until the end of December. If um, anybody has any need for contact with Hungarian colleagues in your fields, um, in the interest of uh, you know, pan-European solidarity. Uh, I'll be happy to put you in touch with my friends in Saged, or I, I know some people in Budapest uh, as well. So I'm hoping that my comments today 
may prove useful as a contrast uh, to some of what has gone before, or perhaps simply as glosses on some of the main points from these excellent presentations. Um, I'm just going to talk my remarks and not read them, and the advantage to that is that I hope I can be quick, um, because it's late uh, in the afternoon on our last day together, and if I fail in that, the water will run out eventually and I will have to stop. So uh, I'm just going to, because I don't have a PowerPoint, I wanted to let you know that my talk is going to consist of four or five modular elements. First of all, I'm going to uh, answer the question very briefly to put us on the same page, who was Danilo Kish? Um, secondly, I want to locate him in the Baltics, uh, which is hard to do, but I, I have a few, few clues uh, to make him relevant. Um, and most importantly, I would like to talk about the intersections. Uh, my readings of Kish's um, um, essays and interviews, uh, to a lesser degree his fiction, I'll be talking mostly about his nonfiction today, um, hits the main themes of this uh, great conference in at least three places. So I'll talk about some of these intersections with some quotes from Kish. And uh, time permitting, I may uh, talk a little bit about, about Baltic literature in, the, uh, in light of Kish's ideas, but I probably won't have time for that. And then I'll close with some good old Czesław Miłosz, uh, which sounds like Danilo Kish wrote it. Okay. Um, I'm a historian uh, who has a specialty in modern Balkan intellectual history and, and an avocation as a literary translator. Um, I found it great fun and I guess reasonably um, fortuitous to work on figures from literature whose, uh, whose writings actually uh, deserve um, commemoration and deserve a wider readership. Uh, before I entered my Danilo Kish phase uh, four or five years ago, I went through a Josef Roth phase. Those of you who know late Habsburg literature, turn of the century, or early World War I, 20s and 30s, will know Josef Roth's name. And then there was the great and possibly not yet finished Ismail Kadare phase, uh, the great Albanian novelist who I hope is, uh, I hope is on everyone's lips uh, in Latvia too. Uh, he should be. Um, but then there was Kish, and uh, Kish brings me back to uh, South Slavic literature and, so and Yugoslav history, which is my specialty and which uh, most of my writing has been on my research. Kish lived from 1935 to 1989. Um, he died at age 54 uh, because he smoked too much. Uh, and uh, actually, his uh, two weeks from tomorrow will be the 25th anniversary of his death. And uh, he died in Paris, was buried in Belgrade. Um, there'll be a lot, a lot, a lot of press uh, in Serbia about this, and maybe even some in Slovenia, Vanessa, right? Maybe a little bit. Uh, and, and definitely some in Paris, too. Um, Kish was best known as a novelist. Um, he's been called a high modernist. I call him a, an early postmodernist. Uh, he wrote a series of, well, he wrote novels, he wrote short stories, he wrote plays, uh, six plays, um, he wrote screenplays, uh, he wrote lots and lots of essays and poetry. <clears throat> um, he's best known for a cycle of three works. Um, each very different in form, which he called his family circus, not his family cycle, but his family circus. Uh, it deals with uh, his family's experiences in the northern part of Serbia called Vojvodina and in southern Hungary during World War II. Um, and uh, there, there's a set of short stories and, and two novels. Uh, from this set of novels comes what I think is his masterwork, uh, uh, which is a novel called Hourglass, Peshchanik, uh, in Serbian, which is very widely translated uh, in lots of languages around the world. He also wrote several sets of what have been called hermetic historical short stories, uh, interlocking, very, very vaguely Borgesian interlocking short stories on specific themes. And again, one of those widely translated from the early 1980s is called Encyclopedia of the Dead. Uh, that may be something that uh, some of you have read. Um, <clears throat> to humanize Kish and to round off this very, very brief introduction into who this great East European intellectual was, um, I always like to ask myself, 
why somebody writes, uh, and I know that's dangerous and that's uh, maybe dilettantish, but uh, it's something we can do, at least in private. Um, and I think it's very instructive about Kish um, uh, because he wore many hats in his life. Uh, he did everything from teach Serbo-Croatian to 19-year-old French students in Bordeaux and Lille to uh, run, uh, to act as a dramaturg for an alternative uh, theater space in Belgrade, Atelier 212. Uh, he was a world-famous novelist and lecturer um, he translated volumes and volumes and volumes of poetry. Um, Baudelaire and, and the French symbolists Akhmatova and Svetayeva from Russian, uh, Adi Endre from Hungarian, and many, many other poets. He did not in any way see himself as a cultural mediator <laughs> when that came up uh, earlier uh, in this panel. Uh, he eschewed that title, but that's, that's just him. But anyway, what, I, I, I think... One, one way to get at the essence of this intellectual figure, Danilo Kish, is to, uh, to, to see him as writing for extremely personal reasons. Uh, this will be underscored, I think, by his anti-nationalist uh, rants and diatribes, which I hope to reproduce in part. Um, but uh, in one of his novels, he refers to the muddy tale of his father the muddy tale of his father. Um, the use of mud in his novels, like in many late Habsburg and Pannonian Hungarian Croatian tales, mud from the great flat plains of Central Europe, mud in which centuries of history is compressed and uh, 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 overshadowed. Um, his father uh, was a Hungarian Jew uh, who was deported in 1944 from Hungary during the massive roundups that occurred outside the city of Budapest. His father was killed at Auschwitz along with uh, almost all of his uh, relatives from that side of the family. Um, <clears throat> so his father left very few traces, a couple of books, which have their own significance in Kish's universe. Um, but he spent a lot of his life coming to terms with his father's disappearance, his father's uh, religion, his father's ethnicity, because his mom was Montenegrin, uh, and Kish himself was baptized uh, as a Serbian Orthodox to try to save him from the Holocaust, which worked barely uh, in the Hungarian case. The second reason I believe Danilo Kish wrote um, is, uh, <clears throat> Um, because uh, he believed that literature uh, is important for human beings because without it, uh, as he put it several times in his writings, the death of a child would be no different from the death of a sheep. Uh, and he said that if we don't individualize history through uh, discussion of the highs and lows of individual lives, but also through the, uh, the tragedies and conflicts of history. If we don't make them individual and real, uh, everything gets covered up and everything gets blurry. Um, <clears throat> Now, locate him, locating Kish in the Baltics, uh, I, I don't know for sure if he ever came here. Uh, I don't think he did. Um, he did come to the Soviet Union. Uh, he went to Moscow, uh, and I believe he traveled around a bit, uh, maybe to uh, Leningrad. Um, but wouldn't you know it, Kish wrote a short story about a Latvian. Um, anybody ever heard of this story? The marathon runner and the race official? No? Then I taught you something today. OK. All right, I shared something with you. Good. Um, this is a, uh, a story that Kish wrote in 1982, um, and uh, no full text of it survives uh, in any one language. I pieced the text together from three different sources in three different languages. Um, this is uh, the executors of his estate, his, uh, his ex-wife and in his widowed partner, um, um, understood and approved of that process because it was the only way to create a, uh, an English text of this. Um, it is a story that, um, that uh, Kish got from a Russian-Serbian abstract painter named Leonid Sheka who lived in Belgrade. Leonid Sheka in turn got it from Abram Terz, uh, the Russian dissident writer. And it's the story of a man, Valdemar D. Um, Valdemar sounds Latvian, yes? Correct me? Is Valdemar a Latvian name? Oh, okay. Um, you never know what happens when you piece things together from this many languages. Um, Valdemar D uh, is um, uh, having a dream, and he's a runner. Uh, he's, a he's in a marathon, uh, and he's got the number uh, 25 on his jersey, uh, and he's running, and he gets halfway, and he's in the lead. 
uh, and uh, he's forced to stop through a series of uh, uh, strange concatenation of events. And finally, his wife comes out and urges him to stop, uh, and then Voldemort dies in real life. Uh, and he dies. Number 25 was halfway through the marathon, which is a little over 25 in miles, uh, and he was at year 12 and six months of a 25-year um, um, sentence in the gulag. Um, and uh, Kish uh, was very attracted to this story uh, for this last work of fiction that he wrote, Encyclopedia of the Dead. He ended up not using it in that novel uh, for reasons that we don't know, but it was found in his estate, parts of it, and they were published uh, in 1995. So he does have some connection to Latvia. Um, uh, I also found an essay by the famous uh, Lithuanian poet and critic um, Tomas Venslova um, called Balkans and Baltics. Um, some of you may know this essay. Uh, and I note also that there's a conference happening right now, uh, I believe the same week in Bulgaria, um, on Baltics and Balkans. Um, so there's more in, in common with this than just the uh, um, first three letters of the names. Um, Venslova is always fun to read, of course, uh, a man of uh, high ideals, um, but a great deal of overlap, I thought, in some of his uh, material where, where he, gets, he dips into Balkan history. Um, uh, he writes, for instance, in his essay on Balkans and Baltics, uh, for a nationalist, the group is always more important than the individual or even God. Were I less reluctant to make a bad pun, I would name this the principle of Gavrilo Princip. Well, he made the bad pun uh, by saying he didn't want to make the bad pun. But since this is uh, 2014, the anniversary of 1914, Gavrilo Princip, the assassin uh, of the Archduke uh, in Sarajevo, um, I found that relevant. Um, Venslova also uh, sounds, reminds me a bit of Kish when he writes about totalitarianism. <clears throat> the years between the two world wars passed under the banner of two opposing ideas, communism and Nazism. These were like mirror images of each other. Uh, Kish has a thesis that I call the grand equivalence. Um, when I have my historian's hat on, I don't always adopt that thesis uh, by any stretch uh, fully, um, but when I have my aesthetic hat on, I guess uh, I see how important it was for Kish's personal life um, and uh, evidently for Venslova's also. And then finally, um, <clears throat> Venslova writes a lot about uh, comparing cities in the Balkans to cities in the Baltics. And what he's really doing is talking about the idea of Central Europe uh, as opposed to Eastern Europe or Middle Europa or Western Europe or the Russian cultural zone. I'll return to this in some detail in just a moment. Um, but I thought it was interesting that Venslova wrote, the cities in these areas are different from the rural areas, often seeming to be islands of some other culture. In this respect, Zagreb is very similar to Riga, and Ljubljana reminds one distinctly of Vilnius. All of this space between the Baltic and the Adriatic is the space of Baroque architecture. <clears throat> Okay, so we've placed Kish in the Balkans, tenuously. Well, <clears throat> I don't intend uh, to use Kish to throw cold water on anything. Um, um, Kish, as a theorist, um, did not write, I mean, he's a novelist, he's an artist, right? So he shoots from the hip, as we say, historically. I've noticed this about all the great writers I've had these intellectual crushes on, uh, the, including Graham Greene, my favorite English language novelist. When Graham Greene talks politics or history, just turn the channel, right? It, it, it really, it's... Uh, whatever. Um, Kish only had limited time and energy uh, to write nonfiction. Um, he did, however, write a lot of uh, poetic criticism, especially on the symbolists, and an enormous defense of Borges, which turned into a defense of postmodern literary theory uh, in general. Uh, his biggest single book of any description, uh, it's called The Anatomy Lesson, uh, and it's also been translated into uh, most of the languages of, of Western and Eastern Europe. Um, but I, I, d I simply want to give some Kishian thoughts on national identity, on the post-colonial project, and on perhaps the irrelevance of the idea of nations as cultural categories uh, with preference for region. 
So instead of nation, why not region would be a, would be a Kishian formation. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> national identity. Kish didn't use the term identity. He used it very, very seldom in his works. He referred to national identity as nationalism. Now, in English, I don't know how it is in Latvian, Estonian, and Lithuanian, but in English, some scholars like to draw a distinction. They, they, they take nationalism as a kind of collective or activated national identity or even the political programs as hydra-like and various as they can be uh, that take their inspiration from national identity. Um, Kish doesn't make that distinction. Uh, for him, national identity is nationalism, uh, and he really disliked it. Let me give you an idea of how much he disliked it. <clears throat> this is an essay from 1978. Uh, this is before, obviously before the Yugoslav Wars, which he despaired uh, at seeing the, the arrival thereof. Uh, he tried with his small circle of friends uh, to do something about it. Uh, this is 1978. This is even before Tito dies. This is even before the Yugoslav project. Cardell is still alive. The, the, this is before the uh, Yugoslav project starts going visibly south. Kish writes this, nationalism is first and foremost paranoia individual and collective paranoia. As collective paranoia, it is the product of envy and fear and primarily the result of a loss of individual consciousness. Yes, he's the rugged individualist and a man of a mixed marriage growing up in a multi-ethnic country. Thus, nationalism is the path of least resistance. It's the easy way out. It is the ideology of banality. Nationalism is a totalitarian ideology. Nationalism is also kitsch, but above all, nationalism is a negation, a negative category of spirit. It thrives on relativism. It has no universal values, aesthetic or ethical. Um, this is his most pointed and most often translated statement. Uh, it's from that big literary critical opus, The Anatomy Lesson, um, <clears throat> and um, it came about uh, because he was being hounded uh, by literary critics in his home country of Yugoslavia, especially in his home region of Serbia, for writing books that um, uh, he got in a little bit of trouble, Milovan Gila style, for writing books that push the anti-Soviet card a little bit too far, which you could do even in Yugoslavia, but mostly he was writing books that didn't show enough of the, the suffering of the Serbian people. And he was being reminded by the literary critics, as he still is today, he's dead, but they're still writing about him, why did he not emphasize the suffering of the Serbian people specifically enough? Uh, and this was, this was his answer. But he went further. Uh, he went further um, in a way that, uh, this is from 1986, um, in his last few years of life, when he was very interested in ruffling feathers, and he often did, and he often said very provocative things. But he said this many times over many, um, uh, many occasions. I refuse to be categorized as a Jewish writer. I am opposed to every variety of minority literature, feminist, homosexual, Jewish, black. I am equally opposed to any tightly defined concept of national literature. I think of literature as my culture of origin. So literature as homeland. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of himself, he often spoke of his autobiography. He even wrote a short essay, again, often reproduced in many languages, um, called Autobiography or Birth Certificate. <coughs> and uh, he spoke a lot about his own past. Um, and, but in terms of his individual forebears, in terms of his Montenegrin mom's uh, uh, very literary family as almost princes down on the Adriatic, and of his father's uh, wandering family that had been expelled from Alsace and come through Hungary and changed their names, um, his affiliation, uh, as he would describe himself, as a Yugoslav. Um, now, I describe him in the, I wrote a large article on him, a revisionist take on his reputation uh, for the British Journal History two years ago. Uh, and I describe him as a Serbian author, um, which I get in a lot of trouble for, um, because, well, 
technically he didn't have any Serbian blood, but he used, he used Serbo-Croatian language uh, and he lived in Belgrade most of his life and uh, his literary forebears were mostly Serbian uh, and uh, he's important uh, as a Jewish writer as a Hungarian writer uh, and person. Certainly the Montenegrin is in there. I, like, I prefer Serbian to Yugoslav above all because uh, I think the Serbs um, are on the verge of accepting him and claiming him as their own and they really need to do that. Um, it was with a great struggle that his widow uh, uh, and his, um, um, his uh, former wife got his materials uh, accepted into the Serbian Academy of Sciences. They are currently on display. It's very nicely done. It was quite a multi-year battle because as the director of the Academy told me when I interviewed her, well, she didn't say he's not Serbian enough or she didn't repeat the usual, and there was no hint of anti-Semitism. Uh, she didn't repeat the 1970s critiques, but she said, you know, he lived so long outside of Serbia and, you know, he, he really felt so at home in France. We're just not sure we should devote the space uh, to his stuff here, uh, which is, you know, amazing. Um, so I'll continue to call him a Serb. Um, I need to speed up. So post-colonial project, would it surprise you? Uh, I don't think Kish would have had any interest uh, in his works being interpreted in this way, um, for reasons I can go into in the questions if we need be. And regions. Kish spoke at various times of a Mediterranean region important to European culture, a Russian region, most uniquely the Pannonian region, named after the old Russian, or Russian, Roman province of Pannonia, the great sea that was the Alföld of Hungary and neighboring areas. But he spoke a lot about Central Europe, and this is the point I guess I'll leave you with. Uh, like Milan Kundera, like George Schöpflin, Joseph Brodsky, Miłosz, George Konrad, and so many others, um, Kish took these ideas of uh, some kind of connection of the peoples in between um, and he made by my count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so uh, unique variations on this idea but what he really did was make the idea of Central Europe much broader and more flexible one that could apply to more peoples he throws uh, parts of Romania into the mix uh, and he shows himself willing to consider the Baltics in this um, <coughs> and um, Kish stresses that to be European means to endorse one's Judeo-Christian, Byzantine, and Ottoman heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, perhaps it is a time for discussion. Have we done time for discussions? Yes? Yes. So please, questions, because it is very interesting, various <coughs> different uh, papers, and perhaps we have some. I will rely on another part of the Venslova essay that I did not quote um, uh, um, to say that not necessarily. <laughs> uh, um, he, he compared the Baltics to the Balkans in some ways, but then he said the really interesting place is the Caucasus, uh, or the Transcaucasus, as it's sometimes called in Europe, which is the Balkans squared. Uh, and he stressed that uh, in the Balkan Square. He stressed that in the Baltic states there's not the history of enmity between the three uh, main local groups that there is in the Balkans. Um, uh, uh, I, I think the most interesting thing to get from all that is the possibility that um, if there is a central European idea, um, we don't have to lump 
whole countries into the Central European idea. Um, we could lump regions or counties to the extent that we need to lump anything. <laughs> uh, because, you know, Trieste is in Italy, but it doesn't mean we have to include all of Italy and, uh, you know, uh, who would who would say that Zagreb is not uh, an heir to a lot of the uh, the Brodskian and and uh, Kunderan ideas? But you know, Herzegovina is part of the Croatian cultural realm, and I wouldn't take that as Central Europe. So I'll wiggle out of your question that way. <laughs> in your voice, uh, which I heard. Uh, because I, I, we are not here to, to exercise any kind of power play here. And it is not a question about uh, whether Zagreb is, is uh, like Riga or not. Perhaps they are completely different. I have never been in, in Zagreb as yet. But I think uh, what uh, in your talk we heard about uh, the idea about uh, regions, about the concept of, of uh, Europe, we can take Milos or some, some other author for, for that as well. The concepts of East Central Europe, uh, let's say there is this wonderful book, and many, among many others, uh, edited by John Neubauer and uh, Marcel Cornus Pope, which deals with these similarities. And I personally find that if we uh, compare us to, to whatever parts of, of Europe, uh, let's say Iberian Peninsula or the Balkans, or um, Anneli uh, involved Walter Mignolo, if we speak about parallels with Latin American countries, there are m much more parallels than we normally think of. And uh, the, the destinies are, are, are more parallel than if we try to, to say, let's say, Estonian theater or Latvian theater, whatever, try, tries to kind of pick up some experience from English theater or German or whatever. I think we, we, um, these connections are really valuable. We might, might disagree on details, but they are really important. And, uh, and it was great to have this talk at, at the very end, I think, of, of this uh, conference. More than a call. Yes. Okay, I uh, will try to join this micro discussion in a somewhat provocative manner. I will show you this piece of paper. Okay, it is an older one. this paper, five euro. Uh, here we see that three scripts are used on this banknote. And uh, okay, in Bulgarian uh, we have such a saying, maybe uh, it exists in many languages. Uh, he or she or they try to be more Catholic than the Pope. Uh, so, this is the second point of my uh, replica. Uh, the third point is that maybe all of us yesterday were at the National Library of Latvia and on the ground floor we visited an exhibition of old books, some of them manuscripts. Uh, okay, I don't hide that it was a traumatic experience to me, this exhibition, for uh, all of the books there were in Latin script, except of two. One was in Arabic, 
and the other was in Jewish. Okay, uh, my fourth point. I think that sometimes uh, we are giving the right of recognizing diversity to the power centers, to the centers of economic and political power. We, I mean both scholarly community and so-called small nations, and this is a tragedy, indeed a tragedy. And my last point is that uh, probably uh, we should indeed try a kind of a inter-regional enterprise, I mean research enterprise, uh, for some of our next meetings. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to remind that maybe from some kind of nationalist nationalist standpoint, uh, uh, the first state uh, to adopt Christianity and still existing is the Armenian state. And uh, Armenian script was one of the script, scripts which was not presented at that exhibition. So it is not only a matter of political correctness uh, to the representatives of Greece and Bulgaria in the UA Commission. Thank you. Again, and I'm, uh, I apologize to the curator of this exhibition. I will try to write to him. Please, more questions or remarks or... ...of uh, the totalitarian aspect of national ideology, as Danilo Kish would say. Um, it actually started with the postmodernist literature. Um, uh, Danilo Kish was uh, interpreted as a postmodernist, as early postmodernist too. And um, it is for me very significant that uh, postmodernist literature um, in Central Europe. Uh, and Balkan, probably, even in Baltic literatures, I don't know, but I would like to um, know more about this. Uh, Postmodernism in Central Europe or um, in Balkan region has been politically engaged. And uh, this, is, uh, mm, this is the difference between postmodernism in Europe, postmodernist literature in Europe, uh, the difference between this literature and, for example, um, uh, postmodernist fiction in the United States. I don't know if you could agree, but uh, this is my um, feeling uh, at this moment. Thank you. At, at, at this moment, uh, if I can say some words to your remark, at, my, at this moment, <laughs> my idea that uh, uh, all our literature of this uh, center Europe region, if we can say about this, this region, yes, is strongly political. As Czeslaw Milos wrote, not only today, but from 19th century, this uh, Central Europe region has differences from West world, 
as a strong uh, in such features the uh, one very important feature very important feature is that it is strongly influenced by politics ideas yes it's not nobody knew <laughs> in this region Thank you. In fact, uh, this was exactly the literary metafiction <laughs> and deconstructed um, the so called great narratives of uh, some nations. Uh, this metafiction as a um, meta history. Uh, as it has been used in Danilo Kish's uh, The um, Sepulture for Boris Davidovich, for example. Um, this historiographical metafiction as a deconstruction of history uh, in a traditional sense of the word, uh, this exactly uh, led to the uh, deconstruction of uh, uh, totalitarian aspects of national ideologies. Thank you for your remark and maybe also some ideas in our last last uh, conference session in the end of our conference. Maybe Benedict want to say something? Oh. <laughs> in the scenario it was that Paul's uh, saying something at the end, because it, it seems like we are, we are uh, slowly approaching uh, the end of this event and um, let me be just uh, uh, quite personal here uh, we uh, we work together with, with with several people as I said already at the beginning uh, most closely with with Paul and and never whom to have to thank really for this conference and um, I would like to thank everybody for coming um, everybody for for participating and sharing um, his or, or her thoughts um, I, I have to say I'm, I'm quite happy about this event. I, I really uh, enjoyed it because it was a good continuation uh, of uh, what uh, we have done together with our Baltic colleagues, with our wonderful uh, uh, Estonian and Lithuanian colleagues uh, on previous occasions. But uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, reasonably also expanded the, the participation of this event. And we have got new new angles to look at, and I uh, also have to say that I, I really enjoyed the, the whole atmosphere of the event because of your, your presence. So uh, many thanks again, and uh, I hope this, this tradition will continue. And we already, in fact, uh, talked a little bit uh, uh, with Lithuanian colleagues yesterday, so, so hopefully it, it continues. I don't know whether you, you want to conclude briefly, Osha. So I uh, hope too that uh, mm, uh, we will uh, meet uh, perhaps uh, not everybody but part of yours will come to Vilnius to the next conference and of course I think that these meetings have their future, have their uh, common ideas and common problems and of course we like to that this, uh, our meetings were problematic and I like this, this conference very much which uh, we have in Riga and I um, listen a lot of very interesting papers not tourist papers <laughs> as we used to hear in a lot of conference. 
So, so okay, we will wait you in Vilnius, I think. <laughs> and we, of course, we will write invitations and we, we will have connections with our colleagues. And we, we hope that our, our works prolong, scientific, scientific, scientific works pro prolongs.